years since we last sat down and, and chatted. Uh, a lot of stuff has happened since. Um, I, I, I guess the most obvious question is, how are you doing? <laughs> oh, I, I'm fine. I'm sort of... Um, I, went, I tried to retire and I got bored. Uh, <laughs> so but I, I don't work nearly as hard as I used to. Mm. Uh, but I do still work, you know, just to keep interested. I think I'd go crazy if I didn't didn't work. Right. I've got enough to do here. You know, there's quite a lot of outside work on the small holding, but uh, I'm too lazy to do too much of that. <laughs> so I must admit, when when um, it's been a while since we we uh, talked, and you said, "Oh, you know, if if you'd like to come back up again for a chat, then then let me know." And there was a little voice in the back of my mind that was going, "Is he is he planning on actually retiring?" Um, yeah, I, I had, well, I'm not sure I actually planned them, it sort of drifted into it a right. bit, okay. and then thought, oh no, this won't do. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, I, mean, I do, I do enjoy writing, mm. when, when I get into a story, it's, it's very pleasurable, it's getting there, it's, it's a bit of a pain, Yeah, torment at times. I guess it's, it's a, a hard habit to kick, I mean, you've been doing it for... Mm. Uh, Most of your life, really, haven't you? Yeah, about 46, 47 years. Yeah. No, actually, 50 years. Right. 52 years. <laughs> Keeps going <laughs> Pretty on. much, yeah. I'm just working out. Oh, well, I, I probably started back in 71. Right. So, 51 years uh, with breaks uh, yeah. on editorial. Uh, editorial was by far a harder job. Mm. Uh thing about editorial is you could work 24 hours a day and you'd never be satisfied. <laughs> yeah. and you can always be better, whereas in your own little, your own little niche, yeah. that's fine, you know, writing stories. You can be satisfied with mm. the story you've written, but never with a whole comic. Because, it, 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 I mean, we talked about this um, last time, how, you know, you, you had an editorial spell on uh, Valiant, um, yeah. on Sally as well, I think. Sandy. Sandy, Sandy. Mm. Um, and Princess Tina. Princess Tina. And, and, uh, I mean, the Undertaker, they, they called me. <laughs> I was about to say, <laughs> one by one, you killed them off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd better get out, but there's still some comics left to write. I was, I was going to ask, you know, was, <laughs> was, was it that kind of, uh, uh, not necessarily a touch of death, but what, what, what did you learn from that process other than you didn't want to be involved in the editorial? Uh, pretty much that. Oh, you, you learn a lot when you, when you, you learn a lot about writing when you uh, spend a lot of time rewriting other people's material. And you know, like in Valiant, I devised a lot of stories for it. So it was, um, that was quite uh, educational. Mm. Uh, but mainly I learned I'm, I didn't want ever to do editorial again. <laughs> Although I, I did do a bit on rock. I was sort of editing rock. Because mm. uh, it, I mean, for those who it, it, it perhaps listen for the first time, like Rock of the Reds, which was your self-published... That's right, yeah. Uh, it's a sci-fi football comic? Is that That's right, sci-fi football. It's yeah. the world's first alien footballer. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go on about buying it. I don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny enough, um, I was going to... When we, when we did chat last, um, it was just about to come out. Yeah, and I think you got about half a dozen shots in <laughs> <laughs> all the way through. But um, ask people yeah. to buy it. I mean, what 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 was your experience of self publishing? It was very satisfying, but um, bank account draining. Right, because uh, I was paying all the talent myself, mm. and uh, as I didn't really have any mainstream distribution, I never got that money back. Right. Okay. So I'm probably just to pull a figure out of the air for the the, the two uh, books about twenty grand in uh, in the hall. Wow! Yeah, I know it's uh, it was my pension. <laughs> <laughs> I just got the, my my pitiful little pension and uh, out the windy. <laughs> I mean that's I mean that that's that's quite sobering. That that you know you 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 have. It, 
huge reputation within the, the, the industry, you know, you have your audience and you, you can't do your own comics, that's quite... No, no, but not a big enough reputation, I'm afraid, right. yeah. That's a shame. Yeah, I mean, it, it sold well, people, people liked it mm. and it was very satisfying doing it yeah. and satisfying a lot mm. of the reaction we got to it, but it just... I hope eventually I'll sell them all, you know, if I live to about 90 <laughs> <laughs> and keep doing conventions. <laughs> oh, son. <laughs> you need to buy my book. <laughs> Do you like football? What's football? Yeah. So I hope eventually I'll break even. Right. But, uh, that'll be enough. Mm. But, uh, I mean, Dan would love to do another one, and I would too, uh, but I'm just, you know, I'm... Unless I could be assured of at least breaking even, I would never touch it again. Right. I mean, part of the, the indebtedness is I never paid myself for a script. All the scripts were free. Right, okay. So. So in... in and yeah. the year I did the Kickstarter, it was so involved that I hardly wrote a thing. So... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's one of the great ironies of it, isn't it? The, 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 the raising of the money for something like a Kickstarter mm. is such an involved process yeah. that it, it's effectively a, full, a free full-time yeah, job. Yeah, it takes up all your time, and I had to do things like pay for the video and, and all sorts of things uh, associated with it. Mm. So uh, uh, I've, I'm not sure I would do another Kickstarter, although I'm thinking of... Uh, doing a bogeyman compendium, which I may put on Kickstarter. Okay. Yeah, just uh, the first two books, possibly the third one that, two th was it 2000 AD or the magazine published? I think it was 2000 actually I published. I can't remember. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it wasn't as good as the first two, I don't think. I have to read it over and see if it's worth <laughs> reprinting. Yeah. But uh, I'm possibly going to do a Kickstarter for that, but I'm not going to put so much effort into it. <laughs> if people want to want to contribute, if they want to get the book and the T-shirt and the poster, <laughs> by all means, but I'm, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to spend that much time on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, this is a question that I didn't really ask last time, um, which is, what you actually think of the the medium of comics? Because you know, all, all my questions last time were very much involved with the industry of comics. Yeah. You know, the nitty gritty of, of, of uh, writing them, of of you know, uh, the the questions over uh, ownership and all the same other. But what do you actually think about comics as what an do art? I think form? about as an art form. I think they're great. I think mm. uh, they're so diverse. They allow you to do just about anything yeah. in, in comic form, and from serious, emotional, to ridiculous, to just art books, if mm. you like. Uh, the comics I still like best are the ones I read when I was a youth, mm. uh, on my paper run and uh, uh, early days at DC Thompson's, all the DC Thompson titles, yeah. uh, the short three and four page stories. Uh, the, um, I like anthology comics especially because they give you such a wide range of material, a mm. uh, wide range of heroes, heroines. Uh, they work very well. Uh, I don't read many comics these days. Mm. Uh, I've just, after a day writing them or not writing them, <laughs> I, as it were, I, I don't really want to look at any more comic material. But mm. uh, I understand why people love them. Because it, it, what is it about those those one two three page um, strips? Because you, 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 when we spoke last, and and you, know, you, you look when we look back at the stuff that's in the archive, when when our graphic novel editors are, are going through looking for things, um, a lot of it is formulaic. A lot of it um, mm -hmm. is essentially the same story just told over and over again. Well, especially the IPC ones. Mm, okay. I think there was a lot more imagination went into the DC Thompson ones. Right. Partly because uh, a lot of their writers were really rough, and so 
the editorial, and they'd have five or six on the editorial in every comic office. Good That's a lot, and they would spend a lot of time working these stories up, yeah. pushing ideas out to, to writers. So that's why their comics were so good, and they weren't so formulaic mm. and uh, much more imaginative. And I liked them because, uh, partly because they left a lot to your imagination. The stories were so condensed mm. that you had to put a lot of your, your, your yourself into reading them to understanding them. And... Uh, also because uh, they managed to tell a long story in three pages. You know, <laughs> sometimes there were 15, 16 pictures on a page. Yeah. And it wasn't so much about the art then, it was about the story, mainly mm. the story. And Of course, the artists had to be good to bring that over. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that's one of the things that uh, Pat and I really objected to about IPC comics when we were given battle to do mm. was they were formulaic. Yeah. The stories, they were it, they were very stale and little imagination went into them and that's what we tried to correct with battle and what, of course, Purdy's department had been doing with the girls' comics mm. uh, for several years before that. It, it, <clears throat> it is that feeling of a seat, you know, you, you look back at... at um, uh, some of the girls' comics, um, uh, battle action, two thousand AD, and there is that real feeling of it being a revolution, or at the very least, just uh-huh. a, a sea change yeah. in thing. Did you did you feel that at the time? Oh well, yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, we were we were in there to change them, mm. uh, and they didn't like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they saw us as the enemy, and I suppose we were because we were from the girls' department and we were encroaching on the boys Mm. and we were putting everyone's noses out of joint. Uh, So, and they they also didn't like some of the excessive violence that we went in for. (laughs) And sometimes it went a wee bit over the top, I'll admit that. Uh, But uh, their violence had always been cartoony and ridiculous, you know, like Captain Hurricane tying tank barrels in knots and things like that. Whereas we wanted more realism. Yeah. And we want, you know, we wanted them to, to, like in war, we wanted them to feel the nastiness of war Mm. and to see people dying and getting shot and what it was like. I mean, that's an interesting point. that Cartoonish violence, uh, you know, as safe as it is, there's no consequences to it. No. So. It's like Wiley e. Coyote. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you Which know, is that, fun, that, you know. It's great. Fun, and it's slapstick yeah. and it's, yeah. it's very serious. And, you know, I, 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 I love the, the Warner Brothers stuff. But um, I, I was having a conversation with someone the other day about um, how important comics were and to a degree still are in formulating kids' view of the world. You know, they're, 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 things have changed over the last 40 years, but they're, they're still viewed as a juvenile art form by many people. Mm-hmm. And yet they have such a remarkable power. Yeah. Because you're you're warping yeah. <laughs> on, on a Battle Action 2008, you're warping young minds. Yeah. Um, did, you, did you have... Uh, did, did that play in? Uh, did that play on your minds while, while you were doing these things? You're thinking, well, actually, no, we're gonna not necessarily tell kids the truth, but just yeah. You, well, up to a point, yeah. uh, we did want to portray the world more as we saw it, uh, and sometimes I probably went into this in the last interview. Uh, in the case of Dread, mm. where we realised that a lot of the readers were thinking were of the opinion that Dredd was the way to go. Yeah. I mean, he was the good guy. We started putting in stories, writing stories, that uh, they couldn't possibly see him as the good guy, mm. making him even nastier. I mean, I always saw him as quite a nasty guy anyway, but yeah. that wasn't coming over. Uh, not well enough, and uh, that worried me, mm. that, that the readers would think, oh, he was the ultimate hero because he's far from that. Yeah. He's, that's one one of the things that makes him so good. He's hero and villain wrapped into one. 
because reading a lot about the the nineteen seventies, um, there's the running theme of violence all the way through the decade. So uh, you know, you, you had the year of revolutions in nineteen sixty eight, where uh, all the progressive forces that have built had built up in the kind of post war period and burst into being, and then you get this succession of moral panics um, against uh, muggers. Mm. Um, about uh, you know football hooligans, oh, yeah. uh, and one by one, these kind of, they all focus on this notion of anarchy, of violence, of mm-hmm. of, of, of chaos, um, and then you and Pat and Jerry come along and are serving this up to <laughs> diet of this to, to children. Yeah. Um, I mean, it it. Were, were you tap? Were you tapping into that 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 for want of a better phrase zeitgeist, or was it just because you you were looking at the kind of cultural products that come out, the movies, the TV, um, uh, and going, well, actually, you know, we want more of this. I don't know about tapping into zeitgeist. I, I think we were just expressing ourselves up to a point. Yeah. We're pretty violent guys. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't want to sugarcoat things yeah, for yeah. kids. We, we thought that was part of the problem with, with some comics, that mm. they'd uh, been too mealy-mouthed about life and uh, reality, yeah. and we didn't want to do that. And uh, we we knew that, I mean, look at Grimm's fairy tales, the terrible <laughs> stuff that happens in them. I mean, kids don't need need to be protected from that. Yeah. And look at 2000 AD readers. There aren't many violent people amongst them, although we did our best to. Are oh, you thinking of one? <laughs> <laughs> one or two just bring to mind, but you know. Yeah, but the, most of them are pretty peace loving people <laughs> and reasonable, intelligent people. You know, yeah. I don't think we did them that much harm. We tried, <laughs> we definitely tried, but they came out of it all right. Yeah, yeah. Because one one thing uh, again, we talked we talked about this last time, but um, the whole thing about the anti authoritarianism of, of two thousand AD in particular. I mean, it it had been a lot stronger on something like action, yeah. which was you know you, you look at kids rule okay, and that is just that's pure anarchy. <laughs> um, but it, 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 even though uh, it was to a degree toned down. Um, it's still there, and I, I, I always come back to uh, John Sanders' uh, um, line about it, which is, you know, with, with a character like Dredd, um, the it, it hadn't been the violence that had actually been the problem. It had been the anti-authority yeah. that had been the problem. You know, you, you look at uh, Martin Barker's um, History of Action and, and uh, editorial saying, you know, when the pages came back censored, it wasn't the vi- it wasn't actually the violence that was getting pointed right, out. Right. It was the the rebellion. Right. Um, so dread is that wonderful conception, which is you know um, the violence of the state is good, but mm-hmm. the violence of the individual is yeah. is, is, is bad. Yeah, sorry, and I, yeah. I, I kind of wanted to, to to dig down into into the anti authoritarianism within you and the kind of. Looking at your 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 stories, they not just on dread, but across the board. There seems to be this rejection of authority, of of yeah. being told what to do. Yeah, and didn't necessarily do this last time we talked, but this time certainly, I'd like to drill down into that and try and find the root of that. <laughs> um, because it's it's just it 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 seems to be always there, you know. It, mm. it doesn't matter what whether you're writing Dread or Button Man or Al's Baby or you know a Rock of the Reds. There's always that anti-authority element there. Where do you think that comes from? Uh, being a bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about being a bad boy. <laughs> I was I was by the time I left America, I was starting to get in trouble with the police and right. things, and I was only. 11, 12, uh, okay. doing, uh, just did a lot of bad things, like I set an apartment block on fire. It, I, I mean, it wasn't deliberate. Okay, I mean, okay. A friend of mine and I, we saw this huge bug and it crawled down 
into the, the side of an apartment block yeah. and I just happened to have a book of matches on me and I lit them and said, let's, <laughs> let's smoke it out. So I stuck these down there and uh, uh, we got bored and went away. <laughs> An hour or so later, this one of the neighbours came along said he'd had to rip off the side panel like, to put this fire out. <laughs> But uh, oh, I think it was it was probably bad parenting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. probably. I mean, my mum, uh, she she worked all the time, and my dad was pretty useless. Right. Uh, uh, more than useless, or worse than useless. And uh, I was just a wild kid, mm. and uh, I didn't like being told what to do. I didn't like being bossed around by the cops. <laughs> <laughs> So coming over to uh, Scotland was was quite a good thing because it sort of reined me in a little bit. Right. Yeah, but I, I've never, I've never really respected authority that much. Because mm. it, 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 I think uh, one of the things that except the Queen, the dear <laughs> Queen, I'm applying to become a British citizen. Oh, are you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that's interesting because that's how we talked. You mentioned how you still have uh, an American passport, and you said um, that's your um, escape route. And that yeah. was 2016. Now, 2016 took quite a turn. Yeah, <laughs> it sure did, year. yeah. Yeah, well, that kind of did it for me. Yeah. And also the fact that uh, I discovered they wanted to tax me as well. Right. Uh, okay. Although it, it turns out, oh, I'm not going to say too much about this, it turns out they haven't actually asked for any money yet, but the fact that I have to file tax return in America as well as Britain, right. and I, I don't feel I should have to because anything I have, any good thing about my life came from this country. Right, right. So I don't, I don't think I owe them anything. Yeah. Uh, so far it's been okay, but... My intention is, if they allow me to become a British citizen, and my wife says that uh, if they read my social media posts, they may not. <laughs> 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 well, I didn't mean any of that, really. <laughs> uh, then I would probably repudiate my American citizenship. Right, right. And Trump plays a large... I mean, the Republican Party has gone incredibly right wing, and I worry about what's happening in that country. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're pretty right wing too, but we're not that bad yet. Yet. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it, it, I think you, you described your dad as as uh, I might be paraphrasing here as a bit of, a bit of a kind of petty petty tyrant. No, not really. No. no, just useless. Just useless. Yeah, yeah. I uh, had to call the police two or three times. Uh, fights between him and my mother, not bullying. Yeah. And, and uh, but apart from that, he was just a useless dad. Right, right. So moving to America with your mum, you moved to Greenock. Is that right? Greenock. That's Greenock. right. Yeah. Okay. Um, a culture shock, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, not so to much. a point, but I yeah. mean, uh, just sailing up the Clyde and seeing the beauty of that, it sort of turned me. Oh, you right, know, okay. What a wonderful place, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Important point there, you sailed from... That's right. Didn't yeah. fly. No. Oh, my... Right. Cause, I mean, it... it we were probably uh, on one of the last Cunard liners to, right. to dock at Greenock. Incredible. My uncle was a customs officer as well. Right. And had we known, we could have brought in maybe a hundred weight of cocaine because he just <laughs> found our trunk and put the, the mark on them. <laughs> could you set yourselves up for that? Yeah, we could have. We could have been there. Uh, mind, I don't approve of that anyway. Um, Honest. <laughs> Governor. Um, so in, 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 in terms of your... It, that, that kind of the turning around of your of, of your teenage years because uh, you know you talked in the previous uh, one about uh, living with your aunt yeah aunt and um, uncle and was was that a stabilizing effect um, in your life yeah I guess it was mm -hmm. yeah it was a sort of normal normal sort of family setup which yeah. 
back in America it hadn't been. Um, so yeah, and school as well with a uniform and everything, all that. <laughs> and no uniforms in in America. Yeah. Uh, well, not in the one schools I went to. Because uh, it, it, it it's that it's that relationship with authority that I think is so fascinating about your work. Because you know your 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 heroes are well your characters. Let's, let's not necessarily call them all heroes, but your characters are individuals first and foremost mm. you know whether they're, they're they're with the system or against the system um they have their own sense of personal morality of, of, of their own sense of right and wrong mm-hmm. uh, their own sense of how they want their their, their lives to be even um, judge death I mean, yeah, exactly. he's got a code <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I mean, Joe's death is a perfect case in point. That, that you know, you, you, you've, you've taken a character like uh, Judge Dredd and just followed the logical conclusion of that mm. petty tyranny of the judges. You know, that if, right, if, yeah. if, if you can be shot for dropping a, a candy wrapper on the floor, right? Why not just cut to the chase and, and just kill them? <laughs> said, well. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I did like the logic of uh, his creed that all life is a crime. Do you? Do you? I, I, I guess um, this is going to be a wider conversation. That um, looking at situation in America now, where uh, whether people accept it or not, the cops just shoot first. I know. Ask questions later, yeah. uh, um, and then, by and large, with only a few notable exceptions, are back in the job. They get away with they it. They get yeah. away with it. Yeah. I mean, that must that must be quite horrifying, considering the kind of stories you were writing. For yeah, them, well, it? we're only seeing a small part of that. I yeah. mean, it goes on all over the states in such a terrible way, especially me too. Minority groups mainly. Mm. You know, if you're a privileged white, you're a lot safer. Yeah. And uh, it's just so wrong. Uh, and you just wonder, how can, how, can, how, how can they continue to get away with these things? And they do. Like uh, Brianna Taylor, was that? The, yeah, yeah. The, 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 that case, is, nobody been prosecuted for that. Nobody's even been disciplined as mm. far as I can see. And then... Just an innocent woman lying in her bed, and they run in and shoot her. Yeah. Is is there a sense of uh, exasperation in the kind of we warned you about this four decades ago, <laughs> <laughs> and it's gotten worse? Yeah, it, was, it's, it makes me want just well. In a way, I have cocooned myself mm. in Shropshire, and I sort of push the world away, and you know. Uh, I object to a lot of things that go on, but I try not to let it get to me mm-hmm. uh, or, or affect me. Because yeah. it, it, it doesn't seem like anything one individual can do about it. Yeah. It has to be a societal thing. I mean, this, this, this is, for me, this is really interesting because uh, 1977, 1978, there was a... a sociologist called uh, Stuart Hall, British sociologist mm-hmm. who um, wrote a book called Policing the Crisis, which was all about the moral panic around mugging and, and how right. it kind yeah. of manufactured this law and order society. Um, it, it felt very much that, that, particularly with a character like Dread, that you were kind of almost, I don't know, plucking at the same sinews that you saw the same trend in, mm. in, in, in society. Well, Thatcher and the minor strike, that was a big influence on me. Mm. The, the way the cops became uh, the enforcers of, of a right-wing government. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't agree with the way Scargo handled the minor strike, but I had a lot of sympathy with the miners. Mm. And to see the police charging them with horses and cracking their skulls, it was just... It was all wrong, yeah. uh, and uh, I mean, obviously, I objected a lot to Thatcher. <laughs> it, do, it doesn't show at all. Because no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, 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 I, I find it notable that uh, the minor strike was what eighty four, eighty five, yeah, and then eighty six, eighty seven is when you and Alan 
um, start the democracy. Oh, uh, was it? Yeah. You, know, you get yeah. A, um, a, a letter from a Democrat, and then you yeah. get revolution, yeah. and that then uh, leads into to, to, to Necropolis. Um, was there a sense at the time of well, we need to be quite explicit about this? Not you know, not just in terms of you know the readers who were. Um, uh, apparently seeing Dredd as, as, as the good guy, but actually, you know, we mm. we need to ref- say something at this moment. Well, I think it was mainly, it snowballed from that first story. Mm. Uh, was it the letter from a Democrat? Yes, it was yeah, called, yeah. yeah. It, uh, we wrote that story and then we just kept going. <laughs> uh, it expressed a lot of what we felt yeah. about things and about... Uh, society, not necessarily so much ours, but American and all over the world and mm. the way uh, people are treated by, once they get in government, they seem to think you're, they're your masters mm. and they can do anything they like. Look at Assad in Syria, that sick, sick individual mm. and the Russians that uh, went in and supported him with brutality. Uh, Look at uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the murder of Khashoggi and the way they behave. It's, it's all over the world. The, the, the right-wing governments in South America. It, it's just, there don't seem to be that many nice governments. You know, when, once people get power, they just want to stay in power and they will do anything, uh, warp any law, murder anyone they like to stay in power. I mean that that that's that's been a running theme all the way through, Dread. Yeah. Uh, the the. Uh, yeah, that's what the judges all do. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I mean, it's fairly early on in this conversation for for us to re- refer to this, but I mean, there's that uh, there's that moment in at the end of Origins, where Fargo says to Dread, "It was it wasn't meant to be forever." Yeah. Um, and. There's, uh, you know, a, a lot of talk about the, you know, the, the the war on crime as a as a crisis that just perpetuates itself because yeah. you never quote unquote win against crime. There will yeah. always be disorder. Yeah. There will, you know. The, 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 but of course, Dread, Dread then says, "Well, he didn't say anything much to me." Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, and I doubt Fargo would have said that if he wasn't on his way out. Mm. You know, if he's still in power, he would want to. He would have wanted to. Have Perpetuated that. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. The, it, it, f- for it's you, death. that moment was yeah. the, 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 the the kind of yeah. as, as he faced his own mortality. He was like, actually, we were wrong. Yeah. Is that? Is that? I mean, is, <laughs> oh, <coughs> wonderful. So, kind of thematic, <laughs> thematically, did, is 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 death the only thing that you think can can actually? Well, I mean, that, that's that that's mind. an interpretation you could put on it. Okay. But maybe he'd been thinking that for a while. But he hadn't <laughs> done anything. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that's an interpretation you can put on it. Mm. Um, I mean, what 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 should we as a society do? Do you think to remedy the fact that the, the, the whole concept of law and order, if you follow the logic of origins? Mm-hmm. This, this whole concept of, of law and order that you know there's more police uh, more discipline uh, is is based on this well uh, I, I think that the British um, system could be one of the best I mean, it's, the, 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 the police are only there with our cooperation it's unlike like America where they're there with their guns mm. you know the police couldn't do their jobs if we didn't cooperate with them I think one thing that would help is PR, so that we don't get like one right wing party in charge all the time. Okay. I think we need a, a more moderate kind of government and uh, a more cooperative kind of government. Mm. I think uh, I quite like what's happening in Scotland. Okay. I, I think, uh, although people object to the SNP having such a, a big majority I don't know if they have an actual majority but with the Greens they do yeah uh, they object to them having so much control but as they're social Democrats that I'm, I'm quite happy if they were Tories I wouldn't like that <laughs> I, I do not like the Tories <laughs> again it doesn't come through in your work at all <laughs> well I mean that's interesting because the last time we talked but we used to have we yeah. used to have us what you might call a, a nice 
kind of Tory, but these days they're all so uh, right-wing and retributive and just nasty, like Theresa May with her nasty party. Mm. And she was one of the nastiest of them with her, uh, what did she call it? Uh, hostile environment. Hostile environment. Yeah. I mean, sending vans round with get out <laughs> written on them. It's just terrible. I mean, uh, as bad as she was, I mean, Pretty Patel's She's out doing her yeah. 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 Yeah, she was uh she's the MP for Whitham where my wife used to live. Oh right. She, so she would be her MP if she still lived there. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I won't go into that. <laughs> well I, I want to go back to to to, to uh, talking about uh, uh, policing. You know, you look at what's happening in America and as you say, you know, it, it it's awful. But then you look at things like uh, what happened with the Sarah Everard oh, yeah. uh, murder, and, and then the the, the, the vigil and the, the mm. reaction of the state to that, which is always to back the of course the police. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, and he, he, it very much feels, and you see this with the, the Democrats in America when you know Joe Biden stands up and says, "More money for police." You know, we back the police. Yeah. Do. You, do you think that kind of the, the the very thing that you were warning about that that kind of reliance you know we're, we're, dread's always right you know it's always yeah, the righteous yeah. file. Do you think that 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 has just kind of embedded itself in our consciousness? Oh now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it happens here. Yeah, mm. obviously, uh, it's a shame because I think there are a lot of really good, decent policemen mm. and police women, but the like you say, the knee jerk reaction of the government is always to just back the police. They, Never do wrong. It's, it surprised me when Cressida Dick was appointed to, in charge of the Met because mm. she was the one in, char in, in charge of the... Was it John Charles Menezes? John, yeah. Uh, and really responsible for that guy's murder. Mm. And yet she ends up as the, the head of the Met. That, well, that's crazy. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's good that a woman was appointed, but I don't think she was the right woman. Mm. Uh, there is a lot of corruption in the Met and a lot of corruption in the police force. And it's wrong that the government should so uh, automatically support them. But there are an awful lot of good police officers that get their names blackened by that, that, that attitude. And I think as police forces go, ours isn't that bad. Mm. But yeah, <laughs> on a sliding scale. <laughs> yeah, on a sliding scale. I mean, I, I, I don't have that much experience of them in Holland or Sweden. I mm. imagine they're they're fairly decent over there too. But uh, um, yeah, uh, basically not anti-police. <laughs> I, I, I think we need them. It's like Dread. It's like I always say about Dread. Well, he, he's a bastard, but. If you're being held up by someone with a gun, there's nobody you'd like to see coming along more than dread. And, uh, I mean, he might arrest you for incitement <laughs> after he shot down your, uh, shot down the guys with the guns, but uh, you'd want him coming along. I mean, that's the interesting point. It's like, with we, the kind of law and order society, is it, is it worth having that kind of tyranny so that you do have somebody like that coming along? No, That for me is always the tension. No, in, no, in I, dread, I don't you know? think the tyranny is right. I mm. mean, we, if we could excise it, that would be great. But human nature being what it is, we're never going to entirely get rid of it. But like I say, there are a lot of really good police officers. I think of the one who picked me up doing 90 on the A12 and say, well, off you go then. And you were otherwise you were driving quite well. He said. <laughs> 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 and I thought that was quite. He could have. He could have booked me there. Yeah. And, uh, maybe if I was black, he would have. Who knows? Mm. But he was. He was pretty decent about that, and uh, it taught me not to get caught again. I want to talk about humour. Right. <laughs> <laughs> She's a bit a bit of a one eighty from what we were talking about, but um, because uh, we had a chat with Alan last January, 
I don't know if you remember um, where we, we we got him on on Zoom. Yeah, I hate Zoom. I didn't put that episode out in the end. Didn't just, you? Just, just, I, it, I, I didn't like it. it was I would awkward. I would love to get you both in a room together because yeah. then I think there yeah, will be that yeah. back and forth. But because of the slight delay, and he he really wasn't getting the the fact yeah. that there was a slight delay. Um, but I love. <laughs> One of the things I loved out of that conversation was um, that I asked Alan what you were like um, when you were living together, and it, without even missing a beat, you went bastard. He's <laughs> <laughs> just having a laugh. Yeah. Well, you couldn't be sweeter than I am. Well, okay, okay, because there were there, there was a story about uh, tins of chickpeas. Was it sending pe- constantly sending people out to get you something from the corner shop that you didn't necessarily want? Oh, no, I don't think so. When, when we it, we were bored in, when we lived together in Dundee for a short while, yeah. and I, I, I can't. No, it was it was just we had all these. Alan had this big bearskin coat, and we had all. I had a hat collection. And uh, we lived in a rough part of Dundee, mm. and we we played cards, and whoever lost certain games had to walk along the street dressed like a ninny, in a bearskin coat and a funny hat, and see if they got beaten up. <laughs> <laughs> this this is exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, he, he was just as. He was part of all this. <laughs> I might have instigated it. <laughs> so there was blame on both sides. And cheated a bit at the cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, we had no money. I mean, you worked for DC Thompson's, you had no money. So yeah. You had to make your own entertainment, and getting beaten up was part of that. <laughs> well, I, I, this, this is what I want to talk about because um, the humour in your work is uh cruel you said that i didn't and people have said to me i'm very cruel <laughs> and it 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 just seems to, again it's there's one of those running themes like not not just people getting their comeuppance not just you know uh, uh silly things but you know it expresses it in in the pathos mm-hmm. in judge dread and i i'm one <laughs> How much of that this is your personality? I suppose it is a bit. People yeah. seldom come out well <laughs> from my humorous <laughs> stories, like the guy with the fingers, which is in there. Yeah, you know, it doesn't work well well for him. And uh, I tried to get them to put uh, slow crime day in there. Oh yeah, and that doesn't work too well, <laughs> too well for him. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I um, I suppose I, I, I my humour is quite cruel, mm. but it's not me. I, I'm a really <laughs> nice guy, <laughs> so I'm not told. <laughs> hey, I'm sat here with a nice beer. There's a roaring fire. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. You wait to see what surprise you're gonna get. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh yeah, it's not gonna oh, end well boy. for you, Mulcher. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> no, uh, there is a. The, yeah, but a lot of humour is cruel, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I was trying to think of a humorous story where that has a happy ending that I've written. I can't <laughs> think of one. <laughs> well, I mean, even, even just... Uh, <laughs> it was look at your dread work you know I mean you've, you've, you mentioned Finger of Suspicion yeah. where, where the guy's got um, his, his yeah. fingers taped... Uh, into, is, is he even the bird or... He, is, 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 he starts with the middle finger, finger and ends up with yeah. a V. <laughs> But you get things like Court Short, where the guy is oh, right. desperate for a wee. Um, uh, 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 um, PF, the, the, the another toilet story. Uh, then Farts, of course. Oh, did I do Farts? Yeah. <laughs> was that me? I, that was you, wasn't it? Don't or was that think, Alan? I don't think. I, I can't remember. Check it. Farts. Check I can't it. remember doing a fart story. But I'm, oh, was it on the bus? Oh, maybe. <laughs> On a, on a Zoom. I, can, I, can't, I don't think it was. Well, the, 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 the one with the, the release of like the alien life form, which is all farts, that's, that's you, wasn't it? 
No, I can't think. I, well, it may be. I don't remember every story. Let's talk about Citadel. Okay. Um, because uh, it's um, another story that's harking back to the Apocalypse War. Because uh, you had war buds uh, oh, that's right, yeah. a little while ago. Um, and I, I basically wanted to get your, your, your view, particularly as something like Chaos Day also harked back to that moment. Hmm. Uh, whether for you the Apocalypse War, Dreads, pressing of the button, wiping out East Meg 1, is, has always been like that seminal moment for you, or whether this is just something that you've come back to at a later time. Um, you know, that you've seen the significance of it and the potential of it later. I, th- I think probably it's something that has uh, become more important to me as time has passed. Right. It's, uh, I, I know we thought it was a, a big moment in Dredd's life when we did it. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, Just with the passing of time, I've come back to re-examine it and think about it a bit more. Uh, Can you remember what your process uh, and your well, your thought process discussions uh, with Alan were uh, around that the ending of the Apocalypse War? Because I mean, that's hmm. it is the the the, the, the blackest, most you know. I mean, it's, it's it, genocide. It was, it, yeah, it was a sort of maximum dread. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, that's his city is so important to him. It doesn't matter to him that he wipes out. Was it half a billion people? Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, it didn't really matter to him at all, mm. or it just seemed that way at the time. Was it something? That, I mean, again, this is asking you about something that happened years ago. But was it something that? just organically came together and you were like, actually, yes, this is the way to end this story. Or was there, uh, do you recall there being any kind of argument about that? No, I don't think so. Right. I don't think, was that you? That was me, yeah, sorry. I don't think we argued about it at right. all, no. It just seemed uh, a natural way to close it down. Right. An easy way, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's really interesting because uh, uh, Garth, uh, in in particular, you know, for him, that kind of crystallises his dread as a, as, a, as, a, as a character. I always come back to the um, because I'm obsessed with the 17th century. Um, the Earl of Clarendon's description of Cromwell as being a brave bad man, right? And and Garth has always spoken about uh, you know that that moment just kind of being the synthesis of dread. Mm. And that, you know, he will press that button. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he will. Well, you could say the same thing about Putin. Mm. Putin would do that without a second thought if he thought he could get away with it. That's, and, a, that's an interesting comparison. Yeah, uh, but I don't think Putin lives by that kind of code. Mm. I mean, he's basically a crook. I mean, as the, it, ultimately, Putin's a demagogue. He's a, yeah. he's a, a, a dictator. He's a strong man. He has no moral code. Yeah. Mm. Whereas dread moral moral code, I mean, is this the moral of morals that the the even you know a strong moral code can lead you to doing yeah really terrible awful things? things yeah. yeah, I think so. It's well, it's, it's happened all through the past. Look at uh, the murder of the witches, mm. that sort of thing that went on. That was done through a strong strong moral code. Yeah, uh, all through our our history, that's that's happened. Like you say, Cromwell. Do, uh, could the uh, I mean kind of religion is is you mean there's so much yeah. evil been done in the name of religion that's can one see dread as a warning about that uh, against yeah ideology? I think so yeah yeah, yeah. I yeah. think dread is a warning about uh, authoritarianism mm. um, he's also a hero you know it's, <laughs> it's great to be able to do him as a hero as well I'm yeah. just Forget about how how evil he is. Well, that complicates things, isn't it? That that, that makes it a, a, a massive grey area. The, yeah. the, you know, he can wipe out half a billion people and go, "Well, they, yeah, but he saved that baby." Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, he saved his city. It's a bit more than that. Yeah. I don't think he'd wipe out 
half a billion for a baby. He doesn't <laughs> care for babies. <laughs> but, but thinking about something like this, revisiting this seminal moment, uh, not just once, but, but looking at the ramifications of it further down the line, it, it, is there a reason for that? Is it just that it called to you? Is it the, you know, the issue of long-term consequences of legacy we're dwelling on your mind at all? Uh, a little bit, mm. yeah, a little bit. But, I mean, when when we did it, I thought we thought that was just what Dread would do. Yeah. We thought that was right for Dread. Mm. And I think it probably was. Um, they brought it on themselves. They got what was coming to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, now... <laughs> There's a lot to unpack in that. Because um, it, it, it's... The Apocalypse War is interesting in, in the context of the Cold War. A kind of notion of, of mutually assured destruction. But with, with Dread, you, you kind of... You remove that from the equation... Because, yeah, yeah. because mutually assured destruction is 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 as as we well, are there's seeing. There an element is, of fantasy. In yeah, because yeah. you, you 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 couldn't do that and have the the world survive. Exactly, or exactly. Human, human race survive. So, it, it, in, in in that kind of case, is, is it <laughs> how to describe this? Is it more that um, you just wanted to put people under the hammer? And dread and because because that's a war st- you know it, it, it seems a silly thing to say that's a war story that's not dread as a lawman that's no. that's dread as a proper kind of World War Two that's right yeah dread Avenger. dread as Putin yeah <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah um, but Putin with a moral code right right yeah. so it, with with something like the Citadel um, um this may well be spoilers for people who haven't read it but one of the, the, the key things that has stood out to me from the story is that um, the view of the past that we are seeing in the story is from the point of view of a probably unreliable narrator. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that, 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 that's interesting because in, in comics, and particularly in Dread, um, we are so used to thinking that we're seeing the truth. Right. Because we see it. And, 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 that, and that's the formula of dread. We see the crime happening. We see the, pun- the response, the punishment. Mm. We see the come up. And there's a very clear kind of moral yeah, Well, there's an ambiguity flow. to this. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that ambiguity is purposeful on your part, that, that you are messing around with the grey area. The, the, around the edges of that kind of very clear moral decision to go, well, actually, there's there's more to this than just straightforwardly pressing a button. Uh, yeah, a little, I'm not sure that this story really reaches into the, those parts. Okay. Um, it's just a, a, an isolated tale right. within the apocalypse war. Okay. Uh, but it is ambiguous. Mm. And, uh, well, you... There is a truth in the end. So if you believe it. <laughs> Make up your own mind. I mean, do you enjoy toying with expectations with stories? Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> leaving things on, uh, uh, well, an ambiguous note. And, mm. and make up your own minds what's right and what's wrong. And what's, what's really happened. Who's telling the truth and who's not. Because... People often, people often can take dread on face value, not just in terms of going, oh, you know, he's, he's, he's mm. a hero or anything like that, but just the, um, the way he frames the world, the way the judges view the world, the, you know, the big lie. Yeah. Um, people go, well, it's straightforward, you know, the judges are necessary, look at the world. You go, yes, but you're seeing the world through the judges. That's, that's the right, excuse yeah, they're that's using. That's right, yeah. But it's really interesting that, uh, you know, this this far removed from that great moral decision, mm. and in the, the let's face it, the very febrile atmosphere that we have now, yeah, you are introducing well, more all, the, all those same things are happening right now. Yeah, 
I mean, all the lies are being told. Mm. Uh, shocking, really, that uh, certain people think they can get away with them and obviously can. Yeah. Mm. Apparently, 71% of the Russian population are on Putin's side. Mm. That's shocking. Before we start recording, you, you know, you, you, you talked about um, the great difficulties getting started on the story now. Mm. You know, it's not necessarily the writing of it, it's just the actual mm. sitting down, sitting getting down, going. Yeah. Um, so where did a story like this come from? Was, 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 it, was it inspired by something? Was it just an idea that popped into your head and you were able to get going on it? Buggered if I know. <laughs> <laughs> I never know. Generally, I mean, stories start... I never really know what's going to happen. Yeah. And I don't like to know what's going to happen when I start a story. Mm. I like to have a few of the elements there in my mind that I can use. Mm. Because that's what the way life is. You never know how life is going to turn out. Yeah. And there's not many stories that I write where I actually know what's going to happen. Mm. And likewise, in this one, I had no idea. <laughs> I hadn't the foggiest. Uh uh, when I started, I just thought it would be, it was an interesting opening mm. and uh, I uh, I wanted to see Dredd in charge of this squad of greenies really and uh, Dredd being real Dredd, mm. you know, a real nasty piece of work and, uh, uh, and just wanted to see how it turned out. Mm. Well, I mean, that, that, that's the that's question I, I think I meant to ask last time, was um, with like the big mega epics, particularly when you, know, you, you and Alan were, were working together, yeah. um, something like City of the Damned, right. the way that's structured, I, I, I'm fairly sure you've said in interviews before that, that you got to a certain point and you both kind of went... Yeah, we, we thought it wasn't working as yeah. well. And yet, when I read back on it, uh, some of the writing on it and the art was really good. Mm -hmm. So I wish we had had more faith in it. Yeah. Uh, a bit like uh, HMS Nightshade. I wish I'd had a bit more faith in that. Okay. the, the um, That was the series from Battle. From Battle, yeah. the uh, Corvette story. Yeah. Uh, the... Uh, Convoys. Oh, that's interesting because I, I mean you've, you've mentioned that before, um, and it, it it's not one of the ones that immediately you know when, when people talk about battle, it's not necessarily one of the ones that no, immediately jump no, out. Well, that's probably one of the reasons I didn't have that much faith. In it, but, <laughs> you know, you, you want your stories to be really popular, yeah. and if you if you're going along and you think, well, it's kind of mediocre, mm. or, or the reaction to it is that it's me kind of mediocre, then you think, well. Why well, continue it? But it was a pretty good story, and Mike Weston's art was really beautiful yeah. on it. Uh, and had I to do it again, I would have kept it running for much longer, because there was a lot more to tell. Because that's one thing that's always struck me about weekly anthology comics uh, in, in the British mm. context, and that um, American comics work months in advance quite often not far enough in advance mm. um but they work months in advance um and you have the whole diamond ordering process where people have to have faith in something before they've right. even seen sight of it yeah but yeah. with british anthologies you you would know pretty quickly if something wasn't yeah. wasn't working from an editorial point of view fair enough you? yeah, yeah. I, th I think it was working it just wasn't uh, i like my stories to be tops <laughs> or very near the top yeah. and it wasn't right right and I put some of that down to being a naval story but uh I mean, it was never bottom of the poles or anything like that yeah. uh, but uh I, I just like uh, you know you feel you're not doing right by the readers if you're if your story's not that popular how much does confidence play in your you know, having confidence in, in, in the story, having confidence in yourself. A lot, yeah. yeah. A lot, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I like to think that what I'm doing is going to be well received. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally, I, I uh, have a good idea whether it will be or not. Um, I was never sure of Nightshade. I, I do wish I'd continued it uh, a bit longer. 
because it, 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 it's, it's great to look back on it and look back on that art and mm. uh, it's uh, uh, an area of the Second World War that really fascinated me. Mm. Thinking about the, the, the context of, uh, for example, Garth's career where, where he's, he's been able to be in a position where now he can effectively write all the World War II stories that he yeah, wants to right, and he's, yeah. he's doing the, the battle action special for us later this year. Um, would you have liked to have done more war comics? Not really, but um, Garth asked me if um, if the, you you run to a second book of that, a second series. Oh yeah. If I would do a convoy story mm. or continue Nightshade, and I said yes. Oh wow! Okay. So I we'll see. Yeah, yeah we'll yeah. see. But I've also. Uh, been thinking about doing if I can find an outlet for it of doing a new convoy story, mm. doing a new story about either corvettes or destroyers or the the whole uh, North Atlantic campaign. Right. With the reprints that we're doing, you know, is there anything that that um, you've either re re encountered or or stuff that that you think, oh, I'd like to see that again. Obviously, a nightshade, but yeah. Um, well, generally, I don't think that until I actually see them, and I think, <laughs> oh, that, well, that was pretty good. <laughs> so, no, I, I can't offhand okay. think of anything, no. Because mm. it, it, I guess the the. the the landscape of comics has changed so much that you know if you look at your work in in the nineteen seventy suit of the nineteen eighties, there's just so much of it. You know, mm. we we I mean, we did three three volumes of the Thirteenth Floor alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and, and that that's that that survived the comic yeah. it started in. Yeah. Um, and it, it, is it odd to 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 revisit this stuff, and, and especially when you have no memory of having done it? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes I look at a story that I've written, and I can't remember anything about it. Mm. Yeah, not very often. Uh, this, somebody was talking about doing a reprint of was it was it rebellion I don't know of uh, the battle for the Falklands. Uh, I yeah. uh, I was this not proud of my work on that. Mm. Uh, I was a bit jingoistic and um, but uh, I mean, Thirteenth Floor was a great story. We always know if we're having a laugh when we do it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's good fun. Yeah, it's a good story, and uh, that was one that really worked. And uh, Doom Lord, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, this this is one thing I wanted to to ask about because one of our junior editors um, the other day said, "Oh, you know what? What was the the story around the breakup of the the, the Wagner Grant partnership?" And I I, I kind of I, I said to her, "You know, well, it wasn't it wasn't like an explosion." I think. It, you, you just realised... We were getting a bit stale, I yeah. think. And, uh, I, I, it, was, it was working all right, but we... There were two stories. There was the, the Chopper one we were working on, mm. uh, Oz. Yeah. And there was The Last American. Mm. And Alan thinks it was largely Oz, and I think it was largely The Last American, because we... I mean, there we are. <laughs> we, we just kept going over the same ground day after day yeah. after day, and... Uh, we didn't seem to be getting anywhere, and uh, uh, I suppose it was me. I made up my mind that the best thing we could do would be just to split up and mm. uh, divide us. I mean, it was a good move, although I think it was quite scary for Alan at the time. It was a good move because he took Batman. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's something I find fascinating. That, that I mean, we talked about this last time, but. Um, Alan had a, I mean, it's still an incredibly uh, uh, well respected run. Mm, yeah, uh, with great Norm, run. Norm Braidfoot. Uh, yeah. um, whereas uh, you mostly continued. Just doing the stuff I'd always just, been doing. Just doing yeah. the stuff that you'd always been doing. Um, but I guess you had the challenge of the magazine. Yeah. To keep, uh, to keep was it around about then? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Because, right. I mean, it, the, oh, yeah, it the, was, the last yeah. American was what, 88, 89, somewhere around yeah, there? Something like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, Necropolis was 89, 90. So you, you'd been well 
split up before then. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's kind of, you know, Break Up Necropolis, uh, The Magazine, mm. and Toxic. Yeah. I um, think Alan, Alan was a better choice for detective comics than yeah. I, I would have been anyway. Now this is something I want to ask about, because... Um, one of the great things about Alan, uh, for me, the great thing about Alan's run is that he was one of the writers who who did return Batman to being a bit of a detective story, again, right? Yeah, you know. Mm. Um, and then I look at the work, what you did with the Cal Files, and then the Pit, where and that's the great shift for me in Dread in the nineteen nineties, where you go actually Dread can be a, a uh, police right, procedure, yeah, it can be a detective yeah. story. Mm. Uh, and I just wondered whether, in your own ways, you had independently <laughs> kind of settled on the crime story as what you wanted to kind do. Kind of, yeah. yeah. It was actually Steve McManus's idea, The Pit. Right, right. He said he wanted a bit more soap opera. Okay. And uh, I said, no nah, way. And then I thought about it, as I often do. Mm. I said, okay, that sounds quite good. And so The Pit came. And Cal Files... Uh, I think it all stemmed mainly from Jura Edgar, hmm. the, the female character, the Thatcher yeah. clone. Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, I just saw a new avenue for Dread, a different hmm. way of dealing. Maybe, maybe, as you say, we were both heading that way. But uh, I remember reading Alan's first one that he did on his own, I thought it was really good. Yeah. And I thought, oh, yeah, you're going to make this all right. <laughs> uh, so uh, I only did about five with him. Mm. I can't remember. I, I enjoyed it and uh, still get nice royalties from Scarface. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's a character that's uh, in the Batman canon now. Right. And uh, they use it in a lot of computer games and everything. And um, because uh, this is a question from Tharg himself, yeah. uh, bear in mind. Um, did the ventriloquist commentator in the first series of Mean Team inspire <laughs> the ventriloquist villain in Batman? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and the bogeyman hmm. uh, was a character we first used in uh, Eagle Photo Strip. He right. was, he was uh, it never got used, thankfully. <laughs> uh, but we wrote him in a story called Joe Soap. Right. We had this bogey character uh -huh. and he never got used and we always kept him aside. We knew we were going to use him <laughs> someplace and the ventriloquist, we knew we were going to use him yeah, again. Yeah. So we, we saw, I think we just did two or three frames of him in that story and we thought, enough. Put <laughs> this, him in the... Put this him is in, too good for yeah, this, yeah. Put, put him in the file <laughs> and we'll, we'll use him. Yeah. Uh, now, we're going to come back to this point, but, but I want to talk about those photo stories. Oh, yeah. Because that is just this wonderful moment in, in, in comics. It's so, so unbelievably odd. Yeah. Uh, that anybody would think, I mean, particularly strips like Doom Lot. I mean, there was a Nemesis um, <laughs> photo strip as well. Um, oh, yeah, so there was. Yeah, yeah. Was, was writing those a different process to the comics? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, had to, so. you had to think of possibilities, what they could actually do. <laughs> uh, and you had, like, it was us that suggested they use a colander with a light bulb under it for a spaceship and stuff like that. <laughs> Now, these days you can do anything with Photoshop, yeah. so you, uh, it would be much easier, but uh, we had to think of just the possible yeah, and uh, write it around that. Oh, I thought it worked quite well. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're amazing, particularly the Doom Lord ones. Yeah. Um, it's just, I mean, that, that was a cost saving. It wasn't. It wasn't. No, it didn't in the end save. Uh, they had the photographs and then mucking about with the <laughs> photographs. And in the end, it didn't really save them any money at all. Uh, I remember going with Alan and Dave Hunt to uh, costumers in London yeah. to pick out the Doom Lord mask. Uh, Dave will probably say, oh, no, that never happened, as yes, he does. But I remember going there and, oh, that'll do. <laughs> Oh, just I mean, like I said, it's such a, an incredible moment in comics because you know it, it's the tail end of 
the industry as as it as it had been. Mm. You know, the Eagle had been revived. Um, you, you got various things, and it it almost feels like something where someone was waiting for the technology to be invented so they could actually do the idea properly. Mm. Um, but in in the uh, in the process, coming up with just these wonderful moments. Mm. Um, it's a bit like CGI in film, mm, you know, yeah. yeah. Which uh, when it first came out, it looked a bit ropey. But now they do things like Shrek and everything. Really good films with CGI and uh, Toy Story, and yeah, it's, it works well in film. Mm-hmm. Um, I want it, it, to. I've wandered off the point. But, um, come back to uh, the Citadel because uh, alongside that, you've got this new series, uh, Surfer. Yeah. Now everybody got very excited when we teased this series because they thought it was a, a, a chopper story. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about the genesis. I just I was thinking about surfing. I, mm. I just wanted to feel feel the air around me again, <laughs> and you feel the city below me. Yeah. I just wanted to do a story about surfing because something nice about clean lines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's that's all. That was the genesis of it, and I thought. Well, Chopper, and I thought, nah, not again. Yeah. You know, people have seen enough of Chopper, let's do a new character. Mm. And uh, Zane Perks, Perks was a butcher in, uh, closed down now, just as you went into Shrewsbury. It was, <laughs> <laughs> so I got that name from there, and uh, quite a likeable character, and I thought, a oh, useless dad. And, yeah. Um, uh, so I, I just just wanted to do surfing again. You know, oh. I like so it's like a naval story. I like I like the sea. <laughs> you know. I, I just wanted to feel the wind in my hair again. Because of course, when Chopper first appeared, he was he was a, a wall squall. You know, yeah, he, that's he, right. Yeah. It was all to do with being um, a, a leaving one's mark on that urban yeah, environment. Yeah. Of teenage rebellion, but then when he came back, he was he was a surfer, which is a is also a kind of rebellion. But it is by making him a surfer, you you gave him an escape. He was able to mm. fly above. Things. Yeah, that's one of the stories I would have put in that book. Right, but the, the, I asked them. They said, "Well, six episodes. It's a bit too much." <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's when he really came alive for me. Mm. Uh, the first story was okay. I know a lot of people like it a lot, but uh, it was when it became the Midnight Surfer and that Chopper really came alive. Um, is, is, is Chopper was? Um, we got a letter from a kid in Glasgow, mm. I think it was. Yeah, yeah. And he just uh, signed it Chopper. I imagine Chopper was his bike, <laughs> 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 but somehow that inspired us to yeah. do that character. Because he. he Particularly the, the the midnight surface stuff that feels much more. There's a yearning there, mm. um, you know. In in an American graffiti, he's a spotty oik, you know, yeah. uh, trying to become an individual within the, right, the, the yeah. uh, faceless city. And he was also one of the few characters to get the better of dread. Mm, mm. Uh, we liked that too. Were those stories, the, the, particularly the surfing stories, were those very personal stories for you? Because it sounds like. That that sense of escape of having the wind in your air of just being you know out there and, and free mm. yeah yeah you know just the way you were talking about it now that makes yeah gives it a very personal identification yeah I just love that story and Cam Kennedy's art of course great artist yeah sad loss to the business yeah yeah at what point did Dread stop being another job when when did you realise that you know this was Gosh. this was a big thing. That's a hard one. I don't, I don't really know. It's just one of these things that creeps up on you. Mm, mm. Uh, it's sort of a osmotic. Um, maybe the apocalypse war. Okay. But uh, I've always entertained the prospect of stopping writing it. I've certainly been doing it a long time now. Uh, I, I, it's the same with comic writing. I mean, mm. that crept up on me. I didn't intend ever to be a comic writer. Yeah. Um, I tried to give up. 
Well, when I went up to Scotland, oh, I yes, could take the mansion. Yeah. yeah. It's just that everything else I tried was a lot harder. <laughs> more arduous like working for George Wimpy I think I lasted two days and uh, the pipe coating factory in Invergordon I lasted four days uh, the dredging barge that was 12 weeks that, right. that was okay I enjoyed that uh-huh. but uh, they got rid of me <laughs> but you were out in the water yeah that was great yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, that was lovely actually I, I do have an affinity for the water mm. you know, like if I was going to be in the services, I would be in the Navy. Right, right. Well, I wouldn't take orders. <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, Captain? <laughs> <laughs> I've never liked calling people sir. I remember in school, I was sitting in a library, you know, some wasted period, yeah. and the headmaster came along, his new hardline headmaster, and he, said, what are you doing? I said, uh, I'm reading French. And he's reading French what? Grammar. Sir! <laughs> he whipped me. He was going to give me the strap for not saying sir. And then he found out I was American. He said, oh, well, I understand. <laughs> I mean, coming back to what we were talking about, it's not difficult to see your dislike of authority. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I've never sort of acknowledged that anyone was better than me or had the right to push me around. (laughs) (laughs) Um, One of the questions that I I did want, and this relates back to Chopper, was um, as far as you're concerned, did Chopper die at the end of Song of the Surfer? Because it was it it was left ambiguous. I mean, beautifully ambiguous. Yes. But from your point of view, he died. He died. But then I needed Garth and John McRae to do something for me, and it was convenient that he didn't die. <laughs> but yeah, that was a beautiful ending sequence that Colin drew. Yeah. That was just perfect, and that's where perhaps it should have been left. How, um, how much of that was, was, was him, and how much of that was you? I think it was described, but he did it very well. Right, right, okay. Yeah, it's a, that's the... when writer and artist work together in such synchronicity that's that's mm. great comics and uh, I always enjoyed working with Colin because well, he just did things so well. I mean uh, if you look at the kind of trifecta really of, of Song of the Surfer, America and Mechanismo right you know those three kind of key stories from, yeah. from that period and, and, and all, all yeah. beautifully painted by Colin yeah. it, it seems as if you know did, did to a degree, did you rise to, to the challenge of his art? You know, you go, well, this guy knows what he's doing. No, I never think of it like that. Okay. I'm just, I'm glad to have him, to know that he's, it's like all the, I've been really lucky to work with a lot of great artists and it's just nice to know that they're on the job and sometimes you, you mould your stories to what they do. Mm. But uh, because I worked with such great artists, I didn't. Really, I just did my own, mainly did my own thing, and just relied on them to do a great job on it. And Colin's a bastard for not doing what I tell him. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go over his story and it's just, what am I gonna do about this? What's he drawn here? But you know, it, it all works out in the end. I just think, did he read this fucking script? <laughs> Whereas Cam would follow a script, but yeah. he just put his own his, his own personality into I love the humour in Cam's script, and mm. the imagination in Carlos's. And, oh, I've just worked with such great artists. It's been a real privilege. I wanted to ask, obviously, since, since we talked in 2016, uh, we lost Carlos. Mm. And I realised this, this is, you know, a very personal question, a very leading question. Um, I wanted to, to, to it's a very blunt question, uh, how much you have felt his absence over the last few years? Oh, a lot, yeah. Uh, well, I was glad sometimes not to have him at conventions because when he was there, nobody came to my table. <laughs> and his, his queue used to stretch sort of right in front of my table. And I have to say, Look, can you give some space? Somebody might want to come and see me. But 
Yeah, I felt his absence a lot. We would have been still working together. On, and we were, actually, I must finish it off, uh, doing Spectre. Well, on. I want to ask about that, because um, it, it's something that, that Matt, has, uh, Matt Smith has, has uh, mentioned, that, you know, what your plans are. Because uh, you, you, uh, for, for those who don't know, you'd started this new series, kind of a... Uh, how to describe it, kind of sci-fi gumshoe kind of... Sort of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's just a, a different, slightly different take on a robot. Mm. You know, it's just sort of more personality and... Uh, uh, yeah, I was enjoying it. It was hard to write. Uh, but um, I, I do intend to finish it. Maybe the, that's the next thing I'll go on to. Mm. Uh, I was thinking maybe Dan could... Oh, Dan Cornwall. Possibly, yeah. I think he's... Uh, just every st- story he does, like The Citadel, he just comes on. He gets better and better. And yeah. some of his art that uh, hasn't been in the comic yet, like the Undercity stuff, it's mm. just lovely. Uh, he's he's really good on big set-piece buildings. Mm. Uh, it's mm. great. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I was thinking maybe Dan. I, I like Simon Colby for it too, but he's maybe just a bit too slick. Okay. But uh, I, th- I was thinking of him. He, he's a very, I, I really like his art. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was thinking Dan might be, yeah, anyway. Because I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the, the nature of writer-artist friendship, uh, particularly over a long period of like decades. Yeah. That... The two of you are effectively communicating through uh, pages of scripts. Yeah. But there's a distance there. Sort of. Carlos to used to phone me. If you're Carlos, he used to phone me all the time. Right. And I ask okay. him not to. <laughs> 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 I hate using the phone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I cannot stand it. Uh, unless it's like, can I have a taxi to... <laughs> Or uh, I'd like uh, onion bhaji. <laughs> uh, I just, I don't like, because it forces you to make instant decisions. And mm-hmm. whereas I'd rather have an email where I can leave it there and come back to it and think about it. And uh, email's been great for me because it stopped me having to speak to people. Uh, Carlos used to phone me, John! <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> But I love I loved the guy. Yes, yeah. he was uh, he was a great friend, uh, and uh, he's a great loss to comics. Mm. And uh, mm. but I, I, yeah, we did speak a lot. Was, I spoke to him more than any other artist that I worked with. I couldn't avoid it. I tried to. <laughs> I changed my number. <laughs> uh, and Cam, uh, Cam, I'd have nice long conversations with Cam mm. and. Uh, Pete Doherty. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, Pete likes to talk. He does. Yeah. He's a, quite a, a fun guy. I like him. <laughs> Very dour. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's drawn some of my favourite dreads. Mm. Uh, I really like it. He's a different kind of artist on dread. He's like quieter with soul. Mm. Yeah, I like that. It's a pity he's not drawn anymore. Yeah. You walked away from the weekly dread um, with Necropolis. So you did. You did Necropolis, and then you stopped doing. Did I? Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there, there's one or two. There's like um, Bill Bailey. Uh, when, uh, when you come home, Bill Bailey. Um, uh, Return. Uh, no, Return of the King's Garth. Um, the apartment, I think, was yours. But by and large, with the magazine, you right concentrated uh, on yeah, that. Yeah, that was pretty. Consuming. Yeah. Um, and then, 94, you came back to doing the, 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 the weekly as well. Um, can you remember why you decided to... Big mortgage. Big mortgage. <laughs> 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 well, if you've got to have a reason, you've got to have a reason. <laughs> uh, well, the magazine, I, I think uh, I was doing less for the magazine by then, wasn't mm, I? Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, I felt when I was doing the magazine uh, as an editor I began to impose myself too much on writers especially Mm -hmm. and I didn't think that was I I think I wanted uh, 
a greater variety of ideas and stories in the magazine. And I thought if I continued in that role, that I would uh, I would not get that. Mm. So I, I wanted to take a back seat and just you know, write for the magazine mainly. I think David Bishop was editing it then, wasn't mm. he? Pretty much. But I felt my presence was inhibiting to other... Right. I was being too subjective on stories. And I mean, you, you, when we spoke last, you, you'd mentioned how... Um, towards the end of, of Toxic's life, when Pat took over, you felt yeah. that, that it, it did create a conflict of, 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 uh, of interest that, you know, if you've got one of the writers who's also the editor... Then, yeah, I, well, yeah. I don't think that was a good thing. I think mm. we needed a good, strong editor that could control all these uh, different personalities, strong personalities. And uh, to be honest, I wasn't really doing right by... Toxic. I mean, I should have contributed more to it. Um, I also think we made a big mistake. We could have made it work if we'd made it a monthly. Right. We were too damned ambitious, <laughs> and uh, it broke Jeff Fry, and and uh, it broke up a lot of. Well, I don't know if we call them friendships, but uh, it wasn't. You know, I think. Uh, I also wanted to call it the monthly dog. <laughs> Nobody went along with that. <laughs> well, the, 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 I think sometimes it's easy to forget. Comics are voracious yeah. consumers of, of aren't they? Just money and content. Yeah. And, and yeah. Just, you know. Well, we made a big mistake making it weekly. Right. It, it was. I I think that the the contributors involved would have ensured decent sales on a monthly. Mm. And, we just made a rod for our own backs, and that was, that was a big mistake. We got the wrong editor and Margaret Clark, and I didn't think they treated her properly. Mm. Uh, I was uh, really pissed me off the way they treated Margaret Clark. Uh, but she was the wrong editor. Uh, she wasn't really capable of controlling us <laughs> Mustangs. <laughs> 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 Wild horses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But um, you know, she's a decent woman. I didn't like the way she was treated, mm -hmm. and that sort of pissed me off. And and I I, I, I pissed them off because I wasn't producing enough, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one really decent story that I did produce uh, got rejected. Was that Button Man? Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that was. Has there been uh, any um, any news on the? Well, film, TV show. Um, what news? The latest move is Paramount. Okay. But uh, I, I believe they're going to have seven years to produce it, uh, which is, I mean, I, as I said to my lawyer, I may not be alive. <laughs> I gave him the name of my heirs. <laughs> <laughs> and Arthur said the same, mm. you know. Uh, it was a funny thing, you know, a history of violence. One decent payment on that, mm. uh, and that was it. Right. Button Man, I probably sold the option on that six or seven times, and that's paid me a lot more than history of violence <laughs> not to be made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I would love to see it made, uh, but I've yet to see a, a, a script that I thought worked. Mm. Uh, so I'm I'm hoping that oh, if I'm still alive, uh, which I may well not be, uh, that uh, I get to see the film. Uh, I'm hopeful, but then I, I've been hopeful many times. <laughs> One of the, the the things I did want to ask about was um, with. Uh, the reason I said about sort of 1994 and, and, and coming back to Dread is that because you, you've you've had such a hand on the tiller yeah. for, for, for so long, um, there's come to be, uh, I feel, this, people use the phrase showrunner, you know, borrowing right, yeah. from TV, like, oh, Dread needs a showrunner. If John's not around being the showrunner, who's the showrunner? And I, 
I've got my own opinions on this, but I want to get yours on it, about how much you feel a sense of ownership over the strip. Whether, whether you do feel that actually, you know... Because, you know, you, 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 you can decide what continuity you pay attention to, yeah. both your continuity and other people's continuity. I think a lot of people object to that attitude from me, that I, <laughs> I just ignore what I don't like. But uh, if I had been the showrunner, there would have been a lot of things I would not have allowed right. that have happened. Mm. Uh, uh, some scripts I've read them and I thought, oh Christ, no, that would never have, and Dread would never, just wrong. Mm. But I'm not the showrunner and uh, I'm not really sure that there is one, mm. Matt, I suppose, but Matt's got an awful lot to do uh, apart from that. But... Uh, uh, I think for quite a long while I was, you know, I, w I was, I guided the story, mm. but uh, as I began to take a back seat, there was nothing I could really do about it. it, it I, I mean, again, this is a leading question, but is that not one of the best things about Greg, is that you, you can t tell so many different stories? You can, but it's just that uh, I, I like... I like Dredd's character to be constant. Mm. And, and okay. when he does things that I, he would never do, uh, it just it's not dread. It's mm. like the first movie, I mean, there's things that happened there that just weren't dread. Yeah. Uh, and well, it gets my back up when I when I, <laughs> I, I, I it's not it's not been too bad. You know, they're not have not that many instances, mm. uh, and there are some good writers working on it. And it's just that they're. Sometimes things happen that I think, I, had I been editor, I'd have said, look, you're going to have to rethink this because that would never happen. Mm. You know, it's just not too difficult to tweak that. Talking about the future, you know, when we, when we started this conversation, you mentioned that you'd thought about retiring, but got bored. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it, one of those cases that, uh, and please understand, uh, I absolutely hope that you are around for a lot longer, <laughs> but is it one of those cases that um, you just want to keep going until long? Yeah, I think I'll, uh, well, as long as my mind doesn't go, I'll do it until I die. <laughs> uh, I'll die at my desk. Yeah, because, I mean, I do enjoy it. Yeah, it's harder and harder to drag myself to that desk, <laughs> but uh, once I get into a story, I enjoy doing it. Mm. Uh, I mainly I enjoy a story when I've finished it. Up until then, <laughs> it's hell, you know. But when I get to, you know, you understand that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's a it's a very old uh, thing about uh, artists like making art, writers like having written. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> you understand that, especially as you're backing up against deadlines now on your own book. Very much so, very much so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's, uh, it's the way I work, partly, because I'm never sure I'm going to be able to... It's like running before the wind. Mm. You're never really sure I'm going to not founder. <laughs> <laughs> so when I finally, I mean, once, once or twice, I kind of have, yeah. but not often. Uh, but uh, it's it's when I see that finishing line in mm. sight, and actually, you know, yeah, okay, we're we're just about there. That's when I start feeling good about it. And when I put the last period on the script, that's great. I think, oh yeah, that wasn't too bad. <laughs> that worked out. Never thought it would. <laughs> is, it, is it is it ultimately because you're an intuitive writer, that it's, it's about how you feel about something rather than necessarily analysing the forms of it. And, sort of, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think too much about the writing process. Mm. I couldn't, I, I would be terrible sort of uh, doing a how-to book. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, well, start with an idea. <laughs> and where do you get that? I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to, I, you know... A fair few members of, of that kind of 
let's use this phrase advisedly, the golden generation of, of uh, the 19th, late 70s mm -hmm. of comics have done their memoirs. Is there a John Wagner memoir in the works? Uh, I couldn't do those things I would never tell people. <laughs> and I couldn't do an honest memoir without telling them mm. I've been bad. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, uh, I, I have considered it and ruled it out, right. so there will never be one. Well then, let these interviews stand as uh, yeah. the closest we'll get there. Yeah, it will be. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, have to, you'll have to tell me the stuff uh, once the... Oh, I uh, couldn't, I wouldn't goes. tell it to anybody. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Too many things. Um, the obvious question now is, uh, looking back on... 52 years of a career. What What is it to have done these things? What is it to have had this impact? It's, it is a source of satisfaction to me. Yeah. I think I can die and think that, oh well, I left some minor mark. You know, <laughs> my life wasn't wasted. Yeah. I gave enjoyment to a lot of people. I created things that I've been proud of. I never, you know, when I started out, I never imagined doing that sort of thing. I never mm -hmm. imagined creating characters and stories. And uh, back at DC Thompson's, I was I was just a hack sub editor. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a career that's given me quite a lot of satisfaction and pleasure. Mm -hmm. I've been able to work with a lot of really good people. I, I, I'm always struck by the, um, uh, when I talk to Carlos, I asked him pretty much the same question and he, he described himself as uh, un, uh, Unuika, which is uh, a rich one. Do you get, do you get that sense of, of richness of having, you know, work, worked with, with good people and yeah, yeah, and good it's been, it's been a really good life. Yeah, I can't think of anything else I could have done because mm. uh, I'm not I'm not one as you know to take orders or <laughs> to have a boss. And <laughs> yeah. the freelance life was perfect for me. I don't, don't even have to speak to people anymore. Uh, although I do I do enjoy going to conventions and meeting fans. Mm. And, that's that's quite nice. Uh, I didn't really enjoy that until I discovered retail. <laughs> retail sort of makes it worthwhile. You can talk to fans, sell a few things, yeah. make it worth your while. I still, I, I, I remember exactly the convention where that light went on in your eyes. Oh, yeah. and it was London Super Comic Con. Yes. And you were bored and you came to our booth and you said, oh, I'll give you some of these case files. I'll go and... I'll have them on my desk. Yeah. And about two hours later, you came back and handed over about 400 quid. Yeah. And you went, oh, have you got any more of these? <laughs> <laughs> that was exactly the con where it, 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 it occurred to me. Yeah. That, uh, well, I used to turn up at cons and wonder why the hell I was there. Because mm. I wasn't given a table or anything. I wasn't actually meeting fans. All it was was a sort of evening in the pub with other creators whereas that's not really what cons are for and uh, that the, the retail element uh, satisfied my greed <laughs> <laughs> and it gave me a chance to, to meet uh, a lot of fans and have chats with them and find out what they liked what motivated them and just you know, and uh, 2000 AD fans generally uh, are such a good bunch of people. I know there's one or two that aren't, but mainly I, I, uh, I really like them.